progress. Well, good evening, everyone. So um, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have to study and for the Sabbath that's coming and for uh, the trials and struggles of this past week that have brought us closer to you. We know, Lord, how much we need you in our lives and how much we have neglected um, our relationship with you and how much we have neglected to open and study your word and apply it to our lives. And so we just ask, Lord, that as we come together this evening, that uh, we can have a renewed um, relationship, we can feel your presence, and that we can see your hand in our lives and in the events around us, just as William Miller did on September 11th, 2000, or not 2000, 1814. We know, Lord, that we have had an experience similar to his, and that we have seen how you care for us, how you have foreseen events, and that you order them in a way that brings us closer to you. So we ask that you can continue to do this. Help us to trust in you in spite of what we see happening around us. Guide and direct in this study. We pray through thy spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening and happy Sabbath, even though it's not Sabbath here and probably not where most people are. But um, we're always thankful for the Sabbath, for the studies that we can have. And this study here on 2030, The Great Reset, um, this study this evening is going to focus somewhat on the chronology and sort of an overview of the significance of why we're looking at this. And uh, tomorrow, I'm not sure exactly, uh, I might deal a bit more with some of the, the economics of uh, 2030, the Great Reset, and some of the other ideas and plans that um, the globalists have for us. And there's a lot of information. Part of the problem is to, to take out the information that we need to look at, because we, if we looked at everything, it would just would just take too long and, and to, so we so we we have to do that tomorrow afternoon but this evening here we're going to look at uh, some other things now one of the things that we we have focused on because this study is in some ways a continuation of the presidents of the united states and Revelation chapter 13, of course, we're all familiar with it as Seventh-day Adventists. But we know that there is this number of the beast. Here is wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And, you know... <laughs> When I first became a Christian, even before I think I was a Christian, uh, when the UP uh, symbol or whatever that UPS the or UPC UPC Universal Product Code um, that you could scan things because when I was a kid you couldn't scan anything you had to actually look at the price on the item, and they came up with this UPC thing and you know people, Christians were saying oh this is the mark of the beast because uh, the doubled lines in the center and at the end that are kind of like marker lines, they, they look like the number six, and so that this must be the mark of the beast. And um, now we know that we're, we, we are supposed to have wisdom and that there is this mark, the name of the beast, and the number of his name. And, and we talked about this in, in another study that it's it's three things that are mentioned here the mark the name and the number of his name and and they're not the same thing i mean they're related to each other 
and that no man might buy or sell, that we took this as symbolic, that this really has to do with the propagation of a message. And we can see how um, what's happening today in this type of censorship that, that is occurring, that, that this can actually speak to that issue. And if we're going to have the mark of the beast and the name of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name, that is, you don't have to have all three. You only have to have one of them. Right. Does that make sense to people? I, mean, I know we're just kind of jumping into this. And the power the, and the nation that's going to have this power is is the United States. It's the one that makes the image to the beast. And it has power to give life unto the image of the beast. Right? So it's going to make an image of the beast. It has power to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beast, beast should both speak, which has to do with its legislation, its legislative powers, and cause that as many of, as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That would be its executive powers or its judicial powers, maybe, that might be uh, part of it. All right, so we can see that, uh, that it's, this is about a government that occurs. And, and we touched on that, it was two weeks ago, it was in the Sabbath afternoon study dealing with the economics of the new world order, or as we could call it, you know, the, the globalists, however we want to characterize it, uh, the UN. Now, when it says, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. As, as I mentioned, uh, this is, I mean, this is related to, to spans of time, because we've looked at this already. At least Miller understood it as a span of time. He understood it as a period of 600 and 66 years. And we see that there are two other periods of 666 years. But this is addressing events um, connecting uh, Babylon to Rome, both in its pagan and its papal phase. Right, so we're not going to look at those spans of time here. But we know it's also connected to the 1335. So there was all of these interesting things about this covenant that was being made way back in the time of, of Joshua that, that relates to what happens um, in the covenant in, um, made in 158 BC and 161. So we had looked at Stephen's diagrams dealing with that in the past. So we know that the United States is this power. But in order for the United States to act in this way, what would have to happen to the United States from the way that it began? How does it get to this situation? How does the United States come from this lamb-like beast with the two horns that mark republicanism and Protestantism and have the principle of the separation of church and state and has this constitution that um, in some ways embodies the law of God and God's character, how does it get to the point that it's going to uh, make an image to the beast? It what has to happen? It sets aside the Constitution and becomes more like a dictator. Okay, but why does it do that? What steps... What, what are the steps that are taken in order to it get it? Time. I think it takes time to do that. You've got to infiltrate the education system and, and okay. politics and different things over time. Okay. Well, we know in Millerite history that the Protestant horn falls, right? 
Correct. Yeah. Now it's not yeah. a complete fall, but it falls. And that that fall is going to continue until we have the Sunday law. But the Republican horn does not fall in Millerite history. Correct? Yes. Now, when we talk about Republican, of course, we're not necessarily talking about the Republican Party because the Republican Party didn't exist in uh, 1798. But Republicanism did exist. That is, the whole Constitution was the idea that this is a republic. Now, the Republican horn does begin to, to weaken uh, during the Civil War. And what causes it to weaken? What is it, what is it that, that ends up happening that weakens the Constitution? What principle is transgressed? What starts to happen? So the Protestant churches fall. And then we're going to have that history from 1844 to 1863. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of things happening. And there's there's a lot of ground to cover there, but there's also a situation where in that time period you had those in the United States addressing the slavery issue. Okay, so so you have the slavery issue, um, but. And, and that's going to lead, of course, to the Civil War. At least it's related to it. It's not just as direct that there was slavery and the North wants to get rid of it and the South doesn't. Uh, I mean, there's other things happening. So what is it that the South, why are, why are states seceding from the Union? because they wanted to hold on to slavery and they didn't want to agree to give it up. Okay, so we know that that, that happens, but do, do the states have a right to secede from the union? No. Okay, why is that? They had come into a, an agreement to form this union mm -hmm. for the benefit of themselves and all of the other states. Okay. Now, so what were what? Why did they think that they they had a right to to have slavery? Why would they think that that's a reason to secede from the union? Because it's not. There's more than just slavery happening there. What is it? What is it that? What's the issue? constitutionally that's being um, figured out. States rights over federal rights. Okay, so this is states rights over federal rights. rights. And so this is the, the issue that really, um, really is part of the problem, right? And we see this here today with um, Roe versus Wade. It's the same issue, isn't it? It's an issue in reverse. Okay, so explain in reverse, just so people can understand it. Well, the situation, the situation that we have here mm -hmm. is that states' rights are supposed to supersede the federal rights. Under Roe v. Wade, the states ceded their rights to the federal government because they didn't want to put it before the people for a vote. Okay. Now, there are states in this country that want nothing to do with abortion. Mm -hmm. 
for any reason. Yeah. They even viewed that ectopic pregnancies should be continued, mm -hmm. even if they threaten the life of the mother. Mm -hmm. Now, there are states that are okay with abortion in the case of incest or of rape. Mm -hmm. Under Roe, they didn't have to consider these cases. They didn't have to consider the situations. They didn't have to stand up to say, this is what we believe. Now, because Roe has been found to be unconstitutional, mm -hmm. the states have to stand up and say, we believe that abortion in the following situations are to be allowed or no abortion for any reason is to be allowed mm -hmm. now there are going to be states such as new york and california that may well follow the direction and decision of barack hussein obama that partial birth abortions are allowable yeah. My suggestion is you should wait till the child's a year old and then decide whether you want him or not. And then then you can kill him. I'm, of course, being facetious. I know you're being facetious. <laughs> but it, it to me, it does. It amounts to the same thing. Well, the big argument that, that has been given. In the past you can look at situations and try to make decisions whether it's right or wrong to have chosen to abort a child. Mm -hmm. There are those that are willing to say at this time <clears throat> that had they been given the decision, <clears throat> excuse me, to abort Adolf Hitler, or Yusuf Stalin, that they would have chosen to abort them. Yeah, I would have chose to raise them properly. But anyway. Right. Then we have the situation with Michelangelo. So I remember a, a, a piece that Paul Harvey did comparing the parents of Adolf Hitler and the parents of Michelangelo yeah. and asking you to make a decision. Would you abort this one or you, would you abort this one? And he didn't bother to tell anybody until the end of the uh, broadcast yeah. which one you were aborting. Oh. Yeah. So now, I still remember. I still remember when the doctor with my second son uh, Joe, because I was still a teenager, and so was um, uh, my my first wife, because um, he he was surprised that we wanted to keep him, right? And uh, uh, you know, and and he asked me the question, "What are you trying to do? Populate the whole world?" And I said, "Well, that's kind of the plan." <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or I think he just figured I was going to be raising some kid who would, you know, steal his car or something. Instead, you know, we got uh, a pretty important person who's alive because I didn't abort him. But, but anyway, the the principle here we're a bit off track. But I mean, we we understand the the principle of of you know that killing babies is wrong no matter what age they are. And there is lots of other options. I mean, even with the toxic Topic. ectopic pregnancies i mean there is an opportunity to uh save that baby and put it in another mother those are possibilities right depends on on the stage that it's at but but anyway um um the principle that we're looking at here though has to do with state rights and uh in a relationship to the federal government. Now, the question is, why did we 
so so we have this issue during the Civil War, and you're saying that the states didn't have the right to secede from the Union. Right. Um, now, did the federal government have a right to um, take away slavery under the agreements that they had signed? Well, to have allowed slavery in the light of what Jefferson wrote mm -hmm. was egregious, but it was also going to have continued to allow slavery was very much going not in accordance with God's law. Right. Now, yeah. the situation that we've had here under Roe v. Wade is the government decided that it would allow abortions without restriction in the first trimester. Actually, the court decided that. Well, okay. I'm, I'm saying yeah. that All right, you're correct. Mm -hmm. Harry Blackman, sitting on the Supreme Court, placed this test that abortions in the first trimester had a specific test. Abortions in the second trimester were to come down to a decision between the woman and her doctor and an abortion in the third trimester was not to be allowed. Yeah. Now we come down to the point here with Barack Hussein Obama and it, he was worse than trying to set aside the Supreme Court ruling because now he wants unlimited access to abortion no matter what. Mm -hmm. And he was very vocal of this. Now, there are many right now that are willing to stand up to say that they fully believe in unrestricted availability of abortion. In other words, it doesn't matter whether it's first, second, or third trimester that an abortion should be allowed at no matter whatever time the woman wants the abortion. Even after it's partly born. Even after it's partly born. This is part of the crux of the case that led to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> if California and New York want to become abortion megapolises. That's on them. Mm -hmm. There are many that believe that what is going to happen will be that abortions are no longer going to be allowed anywhere which is not the case no they're Cause coming the states, cause the states have the right to decide correct now there are there are some states that have enacted trigger laws to say if roe is overturned then we have the right to restrict all abortions okay mm -hmm. and there are others like i'm i'm stating that are exactly the opposite, that yeah. should this be restricted, that they're going to allow abortions without any question. Yeah. Now, do you know anything about um, Biden's uh, executive order that's protecting women's reproductive rights, which is really just another term for the ability to kill somebody? I read part of it this morning, and they're having to admit that there are no teeth in this executive order. All this yeah. is, a, is a ploy. Yeah, because you can't really, they, they can't override state rights with this executive order. Correct. Okay. The situation in the Constitution 
is any right that is not granted directly to the federal government is to become a state right. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Constitution was being written and ratified, abortion wasn't even on the table. No, well, they wouldn't have even believed in abortion then. So the situation that we have right now is we have one group saying, praise God, Roe v. Wade is overturned. Abortions are not going to be allowed, which is not the case. Yeah. And we have another group that's saying, this is just a group of people trying to force their will upon women in general. Yeah, and all this really is is a, a constitutional issue. Yeah. Dana wants to talk. Hmm? Dana, maybe. Dana, did you want to say something? I don't think so. She's not, she doesn't have her sound. No. Yeah, so. Okay. okay. So, um, now, so we have this, uh, this change that happened because you have the fall of Protestantism, and it's going to lead to, um, in some ways, we would call it a secularization of the state. So that, that's going to happen as well. But I, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this. So, so here you're going to have the United States. It's, it's going to have this issue after the fall of Protestantism. It's going to lead to this clash between the federal government and the state legislatures. And then you're going to um, come to our time. So you're going to come to our time at the end. And we're going to see the fall of republicanism. So the Republican horn is going to fall. And we can see that this has been occurring. So how would we characterize the fall of the Republican horn? And how would we, how would we, How would we see this issue that's happening now? What's the constitutional issue? Because I don't think it's just about abortion. That's just one thing. Um, if we look at the pandemic, for instance, what, what's happening to the Constitution, I guess, is the question as we see republicanism fall. At this point, just like what we were dealing with with the pandemic, Mm -hmm. There are those that make the comment that for the good of all, you should take the shot. Mm -hmm. And there are others that come back and say, my body, my choice. Which is, of course, the, 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 what was said regarding abortion. Correct. Right. So they're sort of throwing it back at them. Now... <clears throat> We have to look at this and we have to make a choice. The, the shots that are currently being offered, they're being pressed upon many. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, well, one thing, um, in, in the last two years, uh, when it causes of death in Canada, right? Um, they have a category that has increased exponentially. It actually didn't even exist uh, as any su significance. And that's an undetermined cause of death. Right. Is, is huge. Uh, we're, we never had this two years ago. But we do now. Yeah. So now we have all these undetermined causes of death. And, and that's kind of a remarkable that you can just have uh, something just show up in large numbers that didn't really exist before. Well, and of course, you're going to have some people blaming the pandemic and some people blaming the vaccination. We have in, in, in the reporting that's also being done here, mm -hmm. it was interesting to me that the causes of death from influenza 
the causes of death from cancer and from other major contributors mm -hmm. during the <clears throat> pandemic were very much eradicated. It's almost as if the pandemic cured cancer. Yeah. Which I believe we understand is not the case. Right. So our situation right now is that we have a we have a government that is more than willing to lie with statistics and it's willing to tell a story that benefits its own narrative. Yeah. And, and it's not the scientists who are lying generally. It's, it's the governments and the media. Right. That are distorting the information. Exactly. Now, okay. So to get back on to this, this, this path, we know we know that globalism is what we're looking at right now. That is, the United States was conquered by the globalists, right? So, if the United States was conquered by the globalists, um, how do we see this in relationship to Revelation thirteen? Because the United States. In order for it to make an image to the beast, these this two-horned power, both of these horns have to have fallen. And I'm not saying that republicanism has fallen yet, though it, it definitely is in the process of that occurring. And when when we look at the globalists, You know, we have to kind of determine how do how are we defining globalism? Is the UN is is that the start of globalism? I mean, it, it's sort of this United Nations because that's often how we characterize it. The UN, that's the globalists, and we of course can see this power being given from governments to an unelected body called the United Nations. And, and I started reading up on the history of the United Nations. I mean, it's, it was formed on um, October 24th, um, 1945. So this is going to be shortly after uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's, it's in connection with the Second World War. And you're gonna see NATO uh, also formed in, in 1949 on April 4th. So how do these how do these play in what's happening with the United States? How do we get how does the United States get to that point? I mean it's it's a very complicated and broad question. Because the United States initially um, wasn't an international power. So we know the Second World War uh, vaulted the United States into a global power. Um, and basically the United States became uh, the police force of the world. I mean, it, and I always find it strange that the United States has so many, um, in so many countries, it has a military presence. Now you also have the United Nations, which uh, has its own army, so to speak. So, so what's been happening? How has this come about? I know that's a, a really broad question, but just spiritually or scripturally, what are, what are we seeing? What what principle of the Constitution, or what principles, are being transgressed as the United States moves through its history? That, that's one of the things we're going to have to try to determine. I don't think we're, we've determined this yet. Now, we're looking at Revelation 13. Now, if we go to Revelation 17, which we had spent a lot of time studying, um, and we, if we take Joseph Bates' understanding of this, that he's going to look at this, this eighth as being the United States, that it's going to be the Sunday law. Right, because it talks about these seven heads and ten horns. 
and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seventh seven and goeth into perdition right so he's going to say the eighth is the united states at some point in their history but they get to that point however one wants to understand it um through a series of steps and and i think we have to somehow determine these what it is that causes the united states to make an image to the beast so i want to address uh some of the chronology here so i, I spent a bit more time on that than i was planning to but it was probably good too so i'm going to share one of my powerpoints and what i was looking at well, we're going to review some of the things that we talked about last Friday, uh, the 777 days. So I have this up here. I put that 777 days from November 9th to December 25th and uh, 1989 to 1991, and also from November 9th to December 25th to 1919 to 2021. And we had looked at the New World Order speeches. and. We have a significant uh, date in this 777 days, which was January 16th. It was the end of the 10 days of prayer uh, that, that represents 10 days is um, 14,440 minutes. And we had had the 100 days of prayer and there was 187 days between these two. Um, so that divided this 777 days into 434 and 343, which was a symbol which I understood that I got from the week of Christ. So I'm not going to go through that study. And then we had uh, the third time that he mentions um, the New World Order, that is George, George Bush Sr., is on January 16th as well. So it ends up giving us this same structure. So that's why I put these here. Now, what I did is I put the date here that the UN is ratified. So the UN becomes a, an entity on October 24th, 1945. And I was just looking at some spans of time here. So the first one is the number of days to November 9th, 1989. So we have this structure that's important to understand this new world order. And this is 16,087 days. I should probably put a comma in there. Now, this number 16,087 happens to be the one, uh, the 1872nd prime number. So we get that symbol of 1872. Now, is again, you know, I asked this hypothetical or not hypothetical, rhetorical kind of question. I mean, is this a coincidence that the United Nations happens to be this number of days to November 9th, 1989? That's going to be part of this structure of the New World Order rising. No, I'd say not. Okay, so it's not. And it's a no, symbol of July. Yeah, okay. And it's a symbol <laughs> of July 18, right? Just the fact that it's this prime number. Now, I had looked up the this prime number before. So I, I'd come to the number 16,087. I think it was about uh, a year or more ago. And uh, when I was dealing with other prime numbers, might have even been two years ago. But I didn't really have a span that fit 16,087 days. So when I put that there uh, in my, my program and I saw that number, now, I wasn't really sure, but I thought I would check, and, and it is uh, the 1872nd prime. So, so that's pretty significant to me that we have this connected to the 777 days. Uh, I got a question. Yeah. What is a prime number? <laughs> okay, so a prime number is a number that can only be divided by one and itself. So one is a prime number, two is a prime number, three is a prime number, but four is not because two times two is four. So if it has other factors other than itself and one, it's it's not a prime. Well, I see. Right. Okay. So okay. so so there are 
lots of different prime numbers. Um, they they happen, you know, like the number 23 is a prime number. 27 is a prime number. 19, 17, uh, I see. Okay. 13, 11. You can't divide them by anything. So when you have your flashcards, you know, and you're practicing your multiplication tables, there's some numbers that never come up. You know, if, you, if you're holding up flashcards and you say, you know, 27, you know that you got it wrong no matter what um, what uh, numbers you have on those flashcards because there is no number. 27 is not, is it 27 or 29? Hang on a second. 27, yeah. Yeah, so 27, no, 27 is divisible. That's six times. Yeah, it's 29 I was thinking of. So the number 29 is not divisible, right? And 23 is not divisible. Yeah, six times, um, three times nine is 27. Yeah, it's, if it adds up to nine, then it, it's multiple of nine. Anyway, um, so anyway, that's what a prime number is, if that helps. Yeah. It helps. Now, now, I was looking at some spans of time. I was looking at uh, the differences between uh, the different tribes of the different numberings that you get in numbers chapter one and two and numbers 26. And, and I noticed this number of 28,000 days. And I divided it by 360, and I got this number, 77.777777, et cetera, years. That is prophetic years. Now, so I, I looked at the UN number, and I counted that many days, and I came to June 22nd, 2022. Now, June 22nd is a symbol. It's it's a symbol that's tied to this line um, because June 22nd, 2011, that's when Jeff received that $165,000 uh, to start uh, the School of the Prophets. And, and then they're going to have the first camp meeting in Arkansas on June 22nd, 2014. And so Jeff had noted this. Now, the date at the center of those two dates, so I don't have it written here, but the date at the center of those Ju two June 22nds is December 21st, 2012, which is uh, on the Mayan calendar, uh, from the start of the Mayan calendar, which is August 11th, 3113, Gregorian, 1,872,000 days. So, so we can see... Um, June 22nd is connected to this December 21st date. And so June 22nd, the symbol for FFA, is also then um, uh, uh, connected to July 18, 2020. So I know for people who aren't familiar with it, it might be a bit, bit tricky to understand that. Now, um, the other thing that we have here that was interesting is we have this date then, December 21st, 2012. So I have this, this span of time, 28,000 days going to June 22nd, 2022. Um, and that's going to remind me of December 21st, 2012. But if I go back to the start of the UN and I count the number of days to the mine calendar here on December 21st, 2012. So on the, the mind calendar, that's when the, the world was supposed to end and the numbers start over again. It's the end of the 13th back tune. It's, and that happens to be 24,530 days from the ratification of the UN. Now, that is going to be in prophetic months. That is, if I divide it by 30, I'll get 870 prophetic months and 20 days. So again, we have the symbol for July 18, 2020. Um, of course, 81.7 in reverse, it would be 7.18, which is July 18. And then you have the 20 days representing 2020. So the interesting thing about that is, and, and I know there's a lot of connections here, but when we look at uh, the Mayan calendar, one of the things that, that I did is we had this 777 days from November 9th to December 25th, both in 2019 to 2021 and also over here. 
but it's this one here. And so what I had done is I had counted 777 days from December 21st, 2012. And, and what I found is it came to my 52nd birthday. Now I wasn't looking for that, just happened to be that way. Now, as far as I know, there was no significant event on that date other than I had a birthday. But the interesting thing was on the Mayan calendar, they have a year of 360 days, just like the biblical prophetic year. And since it was my 52nd birthday, as a symbol, 52 times 360 equals 18,720. So, so that was interesting to me in that we have this July 18, 2020 symbol. Now, of course, that's my actual 52nd birthday, which is 52 years of 365 and a quarter days. So it's that wasn't my 18,720th day of life, just it was my 52nd birthday. But if I counted how many days it was, it would be 18,993, which is 273 days different. That is, on from November 9th, 2019, to March 27th, 2020, is 504 days. That's two times 252. And then you have 273 days remaining to December 25th, 2021. And so we have that same structure here between the two 52 birthdays, the, the one that's based on prophetic uh, years and the other ones based upon solar years. And, and so we've looked at that before with other dates, with other birthdays. And so it's, it's significant again. Um, but the interesting thing, when we're dealing with this 2030 date, so the first date that we had for April 5th, 2030, is this 187 um, years from the first day of the first month in 1844, 187 um, if we can't do an ordinal type of count. So it's, it's the start of the 187th year, um, April 5th, 2030, from April 19th, 1844. But if we did prophetic years, it's going to be 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months from the first day of the first month in 1844. So we've gone through these before, but we have all of these these symbols for April 5th, 2030, that deal with July 18th. And it just so happens, too, from the day that I was actually born, February 6, 1963, it's the same number of days that we have from the ratification of the UN to December 21st, 2012. That is, it's 24,530 days from my birthday to April 5th, 2030. And of course, it's the same number of prophetic months, 817 prophetic months in 20 days. It doesn't change. Now, how does this, how does this relate to, what, what is this showing us about our lines? About April 5th, 2030, what is it telling us about that date? As a symbol. What is it tying together? We have the UN, we have the, the failed prediction of December 21st, 2012, and, and also the symbols of our failed prediction of July 18, 2020. Now we're not making a prediction for April 5th, 2030, because we know better, right? We've learned from our mistakes that we can't predict events and that, that some dates are just symbolic. Like June 22nd, 2022, um, it's a symbolic date. We, we don't know, at least we don't know, that anything particular happened on that date connected with our, our lines. It's, it's a Wednesday, I believe. You know, so, I mean, I could go and look at the studies we did or whatever, or look in the news, but it's not really going to tell us much. We just have a symbolic date with a symbolic span of time connected to an actual event in the past. And we can connect the symbols of that to July 18th, and we can connect the symbols of that to April 5th, 2030. 
So what is it telling us? What are we supposed to make of this? Any any thoughts? No thoughts. We'd have to we'd have to take time to bring it all together. Okay. Um, I ain't got no idea. Okay. Well, we have the United Nations, right? And yeah. we're looking at 2030, the Great Reset. Is there a connection between the, the UN and the global the you know the globalist agenda of the United Nations. Yeah, definitely. Uh, United Nations part of that. Okay, so so we know we have some connection. That is, we've been looking at 2030. We've been studying about it, about their plans, and we can see that this goes all the way back. It connects us to the start of the UN, and it also connects us to the history um, dealing with uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, right? This period of time in which we're going to have these new world order speeches. Yes. Right? Okay. So, so can we say there's a connection between the UN and George Bush's uh, statements about the new world order? Is is yeah, George yeah. Bush's statements about the new world order? Is that a change in the United States? That is. Is, is something happening from 1989 at the time of the end for our generation that's relating to globalism? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we've been in a progression of it ever since, correct? Yep, yep. Okay. okay. So hopefully that's what we can see here, is that we can see this connection, and we can see that the United States has been moving in this direction. And there's probably a lot more structures we can find and more connections because I haven't really looked back, you know, to the time of the end in 1798 and see how that's connected uh, to October 24th, 1945. Maybe there's something there. Um, just haven't looked at it. Um, I think, too, we have something to look at and how Judges Chapter 4 fits in here. Okay. So, yeah, there is things from Judges chapter four. What what specifically would you look at in Judges four? Yeah, one thing I was looking at was Judges four three, where it mentions the twenty years. Because I noticed you have twenty days, and I thought, what if the twenty days stands for twenty prophetic or twenty literal years? Yeah, and it talks about the twenty years that they were oppressed. The Israelites were oppressed by Moab, right? And then I'm so wondering, well. What does Moab have to do with like who is Moab? Right. So, so that's one thing that we we did look at because we dealt with the twenty months, right? If you remember, we had looked at it. Let's see if I can find it here. Um. Yeah. So this was dealing with November 9th and September eleventh, and. Um, so where was it here? So the 20 months, uh, was dealing with this history of Parminder. So I'm not going to go into this structure here, but it's part of our, the 777 days that precede November 9th, 2019 and events that happen in there. So this is going to be internal within this movement and, um, we're going to have these 20 months and also the 220 months. So they're going to be connected uh, to this as well. Um, we also have 360 months in there, which is significant. Um, though that's pretty obvious that 30 years has 360 months, but it's still part of the fact that we can use these, these actual Gregorian months. Um, so, so we did deal with the, the 20 years as sim symbolizing 20, 20 months. Um, okay. 
so understanding Moab, we've, we've looked at Moab before as well, but that, that, that's a bit beyond this study to go into that again. But what we can see here is, and I'm trying to find the slide I was on. Um, the thing with, with Moab, that's a, they, they began as, as, as an incestuous relationship between the father and daughter. And I know that these people that are, they want to take the world, they want to enslave those that are not of their pedigree, as I put on one in one of my songs, they're mm -hmm. incestuous. The satanic bloodlines are very incestuous. They're very intermarried. And so that would have a bearing on this too. Yeah, well, even just though as a symbol, right? So it's... Um... A forbidden relationship. I mean, we we know that that symbolizes, and and the father can symbolize um, the the state. Symbol you know, power, and yeah. Symbolize a church. So so yeah, we know that we have that that symbol there. But when we're looking at this progression of the United States moving from this lamb-like beast, we know that the two horns have to fall. Protestantism and Republicanism in order for this Sunday law to occur. But it's occurred in these series of steps that the United States has taken. So one is it's, it's moved away from its mandate as far as the Constitution is concerned, if you want to call that a mandate, from the principles that were laid down. That is, the United States was not meant to be the world's police force. Um, and the United States begins especially in the Second World War, to, to interfere. Now, one is they, they're, they're protecting their own interests because they see these threats uh, from outside the United States. So they're starting to move away from being sort of insular uh, to being this global power and, and pushing their weight around, so to speak, so that they can protect their interests. But this is going to undermine... Uh, the principles of the United States, because the armies weren't meant so much uh, to attack, to deal with other countries' issues. Because even when, when they started dealing with the war that happened with on the Barbary Coast, why was the United States involved in that uh, military action? Well, as Dwight mentioned, one of their battleships was attacked, and so they went went against the pirates. I right, so, so they're being attacked. Them. They're not trying to settle some other nation's problems, right? They're they're protecting their own ships. Um, so, so that's why they're involved. But the United States comes to the point where they're they're getting involved in other countries. Um, even though they're not directly being threatened. You know, the Lord would have given them that kind of world power that they that they were craving if they'd done it in the right way, just as with, with Israel. If yeah. Israel had followed God the way she was supposed to, she would have been blessed and she would have been a light for the whole world. The same thing with the U.S. The U.S. was so mightily blessed, like Ellen White said, above all the other nations. But look what she did with it. Yeah. So it starts to use worldly policy. It's not honest. It's not Christian, really, in how it's dealing with things. And, and it starts to become corrupt. So some of the actions that it's taking aren't really to protect the United States. They're to fill the pockets of the elites, of the politicians, of their friends. And so it's, it's not going to be... We know that once that happens, the United States can no longer stand. But it's going to be driven to this Sunday law. And not out of some kind of religious um, sense or idea that they're going to bring about the Sunday law, Sunday law. It has to do with power. Now, even when you look at the pandemic and you look at... Um, I mean, because my view is that the government shouldn't be involved in public health. There shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be a role of the government. I'm not sure how that quite happens. Um, 
And right. I'm looking at Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That includes Canada and everywhere else. People forget that. Yeah. Just because you're a nationalist of some country and you're patriotic does not make you exempt from God's judgment. He judges everybody impartially. Right. But but the point is with a um, with the powers and the things that governments are doing, um, I don't see that they that that. In, especially in in the United States, that that should ever have happened, that the government should be taking these positions to basically create a nanny state, where the government is protecting us from ourselves. And totally agree. I've had lots of talks about that lately with people. Yeah, but you know, we live we live in a, a world where people are not not really. They're, they don't understand the implications of their direction that, that they're going. We depend upon the state now, where before the state really uh, had very few roles. It provided for a military of defense. It provided um, an opportunity for um, organizing transportation and different types of services. Uh, but really, a lot of the powers were the powers of the state. And, and even the powers that the individual states ha had didn't really interfere with the individual's lives. As people could make their own choices about many, many things. But we've slowly seen that that has eroded. So we're going to get to the point where we have a Sunday law, where we have the globalists um, enforcing the Sunday and and that's and as i've said before this has always been a problem for me looking at the world that we have that's moving to be more and more secular the question is does it become more and more religious to bring about a sunday law and the answer to that would be no it's not so much about religion as about power because the catholic church is really not a religious power i mean it is but it's trying to exercise control over governments it's not using the gospel um, to be an influence it's using the laws of the land to try to bring about paradise on earth or something like that i'm not really quite sure what they think that they would achieve but we can see that the United States is becoming more and more secular. And it's the secularists that are going to be connected to this Sunday law, as well as the churches, because the churches are becoming more secular. That is, the churches are not interested in the gospel. And this is quite a drastic move. I mean, the changes when we were studying um, examining the foundation of this message. In the 1990s, we could not have foreseen what exists today. I mean, we knew the world was going to get worse, but we really saw the Sunday laws coming from the moral majority, the evangelicals, pushing for the Sunday law, combining with the papacy to bring about this forced religion. But when now we see it's quite a bit different than we imagined. That it's happening, but it's happening for a different reason. Because we, we've, we haven't so much talked about it here, but most of you have probably talked about the idea of how global warming is um, bringing about the idea that we need to have one day off. We need to shut down the world for one day a week. And of course, they're going to choose Sunday to do so. Now, does it make a difference, the reasons for the enforcement of Sunday, as far as fulfilling a Sunday law? Does it have to be religious? Depends on what you mean, because I, I know when, when I was a Catholic, those priests and nuns were meddling, especially the priests, meddling in every, they like, tried to get into every aspect of our lives. You know, it's like we were being monitored so much. Okay. So, 
yeah, worshiping the church. Now you follow these rituals, this liturgy, and you have to go to confession here and you say how many prayers and do the, you know do your penance this way. And if if your parents catch you doing something, my my I remember my distinctly my brother and me being forced, flung to our knees and repeat the act of contrition, you know. Uh, it was it was just absolutely horrendously oppressive. I mean, even within yeah. your own home, and you had to report to the priest how your family was doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. You wonder why I wanted to leave yeah. Augustinian Catholicism? Well, <laughs> I'm always well, Martin Luther. Yeah, but we know it's going to be the United States that makes the image to the beast. So this has to do with the fact that church and state are combined. That. That there no, is. Religion, uh, What's that, Jeff? I was just saying it's starting off. It starts off uh, could be secular, and then the religious religious part of it comes into play too down the yes, line. But but when it talks about religion, I mean Protestantism is not the Protestantism of thirty years ago. No. What we what we call the Protestant churches now are basically woke. Yep. <laughs> and it's even happening to Adventism. Even in, yeah, even in the Adventist church. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what it was, you know, like seven years ago, we were just, you know, dealing with women's ordination. But now, you know, the issue is, is, is growing into something dealing with, you know, I mean, how can you have talk about women's ordination if you don't even know what a woman is, right? Um, so, so this is is a difficulty that you know that arises um, within the church. What's happening with our armed forces right now? Thanks to Mr. J T slash C, you know this wokeism. Oh, you can go around dating your same sex. You can have whatever hair color or style you want. You can wear male uniform, female uniform, or a mixture of the two. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. So now Trudeau is bent on totally destroying. The, the military is going to be so offensive and so repulsive to so many that who is going to want to join? I had a friend who was with with the army for a while, and she said she reported this to me. And then sure enough, I looked it up and yeah, it's happening. Why am well, I not surprised? Well, well, yeah, it's kind of interesting because uh, the American military is going the way of the United Church of Canada. Nobody wants to be a member of the United Church of Canada. It used to be the biggest church in Canada. Um, but all their churches are shutting down because nobody wants to go there. And it's going to be the same. Who's going to want to serve? But anyway, um, when we look at this issue, whether it's religious or not, you know, I just, uh, okay, good. Um, uh, got a, somebody's mic's making noise. Okay, I guess everybody's muted now. So when we look at, what we talked about at the beginning um, that no man might buy or sell save he have the mark the name of the beast or the number of his name so remember there's three different things that they don't have to have all three it's one or the other so when we talk about the mark of the beast people talk about receiving the mark of the beast well not everybody receives the mark of the beast, right? I mean, that is, it says they all are going to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads, right? So, so there is a mark connected here, but they're now going to distinguish what that is. It's, it's the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we know we always have understood that the right hand has to do with your actions and the forehead has to do with your thoughts. So some people are just going to be forced to do, to receive the mark of the beast. They're not really behind it intellectually, but there's others who are going to buy into it. But the name of the beast would have to do with the character of the beast. That is, the beast is acting in a certain way, and people are going to act in that same way. But then we, we deal with the number of his name, as we talked about, this. that this is a... A span of time. That's the way that it was understood by Miller, that this number is 666 years. 
So when we look at these spans of time, when we look at this structural chronology, the structure of prophetic chronology, we look at how these things lie down in our lines, it's witnessing to the fact that this is connected with the prophecies in the book of Daniel, the Babylon, pagan, Rome, papal, and the present order of things are all connected. And in order for us to understand how to avoid receiving the mark of the beast, how is it that most Adventists would think that they can avoid the mark of the beast? What do you have to do as a Seventh-day Adventist to not receive the mark of the beast? Oliver, you can't be mainstream. You've got to take a stand for God. Okay, but I'm saying the average Adventist, not talking about what's right. I'm talking about how Adventists look at it. You know, traditional. Yeah, you keep the Saturday as the Sabbath. And if you keep Saturday as the Sabbath, you can't possibly be deceived, right? You know, there's basically two different things that are presented in evangelistic series. You keep the Sabbath and you know that Jesus is going to come back from heaven. So you're not going to believe in, in the Antichrist because he's going to appear here and there. So you're not going to be deceived by that. And, and you're going to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. And so you will be safe. But is that enough? Is that correct? The thing is, who does keep Sabbath perfectly? None of us do, and especially mainstream. I mean, I've listened to these mainstream. They talk about everything except Christ and, and having a holy life on Sabbath, a lot of them. It's, it's sickening being among them. You know, okay. I just couldn't stand it. Right, so it has to do with character, doesn't it? Amen. So the church now is attacking the whole idea that we can even reflect Christ's character on any level. They call that last generation theology, and that this is the danger of the church. And it's being attacked um, within the church in a large, a large way. That is, if you believe in what they call last generation theology, you are the enemy in Adventism. Now, of course, we have a general conference president who at least gives lip service to last generation theology. But he's not doing anything about it within the church we still have the vast majority of our pastors who no longer believe that we can overcome sin or that we need a final generation to reflect christ's character because that's not what they're taught when they become a pastor when they go to andrews so so we have a major problem with as as a seventh-day adventist when it comes to recognizing what it is that we have to do um for the average adventist they have no idea and that they are receiving the mark of the beast even now especially as we come to this image of the beast test what however that we're going to understand that but people are making choices now and when it comes to uh, the Sunday law, they will have justifications for why they are going to bow down. And so the issue is much more complex. What, what I'm trying to convey is that we can have it in our minds. And, and you know, it's easy to point at, at nominal Adventists and say, well, you know, they don't keep the Sabbath. But it's it's not so simple. And even for us, God is bringing us through an experience so that we can learn to trust in him. And many of us think, like Peter, that we are not going to forsake Christ, but we don't know our own selves. We think that if we're in the know, if we know what's happening, you know, behind the scenes, that somehow we're not going to get deceived. But the thing is, we've already been deceiving ourselves. 
And what I really believe that God is showing us in all these things that he's showing us, not just in this study, but in all of our studies, is that he is in charge, that we need a deeper, we need to enter into covenant with him. And we have, oh, and we have no idea what that means. That is, we have been playing around with God for a long time. And, and we can be, we can know a lot of things, right? And we can think, well, because I know a lot of things, that means I'm not going to be deceived. But we need that revelation of Christ. We need to see ourselves as we really are. Because this is a number of a man, of a man. And we are men. It's describing, this mark of the beast is describing our nature. We need to receive the seal of God. We need to have Christ's character. We need to have his spirit fill us. And that's something that we can't do. We can't just change. Something has to happen to us that, that we cooperate with Christ in a work that he's trying to do. And that means trials. That means difficulties. That means running into situations that are going to make us even doubt the very fact that we are Christians. Because when we really honestly look at ourselves, the question is, are we? Are we any different than the people that we judge? And this, this is the real problem. This is the problem of man. And the United States is just acting as human nature acts. It's doing the things that human nature does. It's looking out for number one. It's competitive. It thinks that it's okay and everyone else is wrong. And so we're no different. So we're, we're going to try to look at that again tomorrow um, in the study in the afternoon. We got have Dwight's study in the morning at 7.30 my time. And, and then we have the study at 2 Mountain Time again in the afternoon. And, and Dwight's study has been focusing upon really the need that we have to be converted. Thank God for that. Yeah, but we also know that God has given us this light so that we can be converted. That is, but we have to walk in that light. We have to be tested. So however we want to look at it, even as we look at all of these things dealing with what's happening out there, the only thing we have control over is what's happening inside of us. And we only have control of that as we connect with Christ. We can make choices, but we need to make a choice that allows God to reveal to us who we really are. So this is, this is where we are at at this moment with this movement. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Well, we, we should pray for one another. We know that there, there are people in this group who are having major trials, trials with their health, trials in other various ways. We know some people have COVID, family has COVID, people have problems with their sight and family members who are sick and um, people are dealing with illnesses themselves and um, there's people around us who need that loving care and so we need to be able to uh, to accomplish those tasks that christ puts in front of us so let's let's pray together <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours that are coming. 
or may even be here. We need you every hour. We are thankful for these studies of chronology, of the stories in the Bible. And as we look at current events, we are thankful, Lord, that you have given us a sure word of prophecy. But Lord, we know how frail we are and how much we need you. Uh, how often we have had to bow at the feet of Jesus in shame because we cannot represent you. We are thankful, Lord, for this light. Let it shine into our darkness and expose our deeds that we may receive your cleansing. Help us to invite Christ in, into our lives. We pray for the studies this Sabbath, and that your Holy Spirit can speak to each person. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.